Hello everyone. So in this session, we are going to continue with uh, the rest of the topics that is the morphology of various organs during uh, in the systemic lupus erythematosus, the clinical features, the 2019 updated ULAR or the American College of Rheumatology classification of systemic lupus erythematosus and treatment. But before going into that, I want to give you a revision or a quick review of what we have discussed last class. So here I would like to first discuss about the various antibodies we would come across in systemic lupus erythematosus. This table is actually very important because this question has been very commonly asked in the uh, PG entrance exam question that is what is the most sensitive, what is the most specific antibodies and so and so. So let me clarify the most sensitive antibody if they ask you overall what is the most sensitive antibody for SLE your answer should be anti-nuclear antibody okay ANA. Suppose if they ask you what is the most specific antibody your answer should be anti-Smith antibody. If they ask you what is both the most sensitive as well as specific you can go for anti-double standard DNA. Then. In case of drug induced uh, lupus, okay, in case of drug induced lupus, antihistone antibody, okay, this is a recent update from 21st edition of Harrison. But what is the most specific antibody in neolatal lupus with congenital heart block? Your answer should be anti rho, okay, that is SSA antibody. And in antibody in SLE which predisposes to phototoxicity, your answer should be again it is also what SSA. So SSA for neonatal lupus with congenital heart block as well as with SLE which predisposes to phototoxicity. Then we have something what we call the shrinking lung syndrome. Okay, that means uh, that will, the lung will undergo uh, what shrinkage. Okay, yeah, it's one of the morphological changes we will get in the lung in SLE. In such a case, it is also associated with the anti what RO. That is so SSA antibody is associated with the three conditions. Conditions. One is what neonatal lupus with the congenital heart block. Number two is phototoxicity, and number three is nothing else but what we call it as the shrinking lung syndrome. Fine. Then suppose if the SLE is associated with the Raynaud's phenomenon, you know what is Raynaud's phenomenon? There will be vasoconstrictions of the what small arterioles present in the palms and digits. So that is called the Raynaud's phenomenon. So this is associated with the anti U1 ribonucleoprotein. And if suppose you know I told you in the last class there will be neuro you know systemic lupus erythematosus. SLE, SLE is a systemic disease. So it is having lot of CNS manifestations like a neurological deficit, then cognitive dysfunction and other CNS abnormality. So the neuropsychiatric features will be associated with the anti-ribosomal P antibody anti-ribosomal P antibody so please go through this table again and again write it somewhere in a piece of paper and revise it frequently from this one MCQ must okay one MCQ must from this table okay so that is the first thing I would like to revise you okay yes the second thing what I want to uh, stress you is about the two important thing that is what we call it as water hematoxylin body or lupus erythematosus cell Sorry, bodies and lupus erythematosus cell. What are LE bodies and what are LE cells? See, remember, whenever there is any nucleus of the damaged cell comes in contact and binds with the immune complexes in the SLE, the chromatin will be lost and it will become homogeneous. And this is what we call it as the lupus erythematosus bodies. This is called as lupus erythematosus bodies. And these are also called as hematoxylin bodies. These are also called as hematoxylin bodies. Suppose when these bodies, okay, when these bodies, okay, I have, uh, written here LE cell wrong it is not LE cell it is LE bodies so when these LE bodies are engulfed by the neutrophils and macrophages which are present in the blood we call that what neutrophil or the macrophage as LE cell so what is LE cell it is nothing else but a macrophage which has engulfed the LE bodies so this is nothing else but what we call it as an LE cell so and high yield info high yield info which you may get a question in INICT exam Okay, what is that I N I C E T exam? What is it? That is called as tart cell. What is tart cell? So suppose these macrophages or neutrophils phagocytose the nucleus, and at the same time the nuclear structure is preserved. That means the chromatin is intact. We call it as tart cell. In LE cell, what is happened? The nucleus is already damaged. The damaged nucleus binds to the immune complexes. Finally, it will be engulfed by the macrophages to form LE cell. So this is the difference. In tart cell, the the nuclear remain what the chromatin remains intact. Okay, so that is the major difference between tart cell as well as 
our uh, LD cell. Okay, yes. So these are the very very important point. Then another one important thing: the predisposing factors. Okay, predisposing factor. Remember which gene? Okay, this this uh, question has been asked. That is why I have decided to repeat it. Trex one, Trex one, which is located in X chromosome, have increased risk. Okay, increased risk of developing SLE. Increased risk of developing SLE. Fine. Yes. Then another one important thing: Epstein Barr virus infection, smoking. Epstein Barr virus infection and smoking is also associated with increased risk of developing SLE. Fine. Yes. Then another one important thing uh, is deficiency of C1Q, C2, and C4. See Trex1 mutation. Trex1 mutation. Remember, Trex1 is actually that gene is located in the X chromosome. Fine. Then HLA DRB1, DR3, DQA2. Okay, these are another important things. Then for lupus nephritis, yes, this is another important question they have asked you. Then for lupus nephritis, for lupus nephritis, lupus nephritis, HLA DR3. HLA DR3 and EFC GR3A. These are the two genes which are associated to have increased risk of developing lupus nephritis. Lupus nephritis. Okay. Yes. So these are some of the important uh, points that I have missed in the last class, and that's why I have reinforced again. Fine. Yes. Next, we are going to study about the morphology. I told you that systemic lupus erythematosus. So it is a systemic disease. So all systems will be affected. So we are going to see what happens in each of the systems in detail out of that nephritis, lupus nephritis and its classification, various classes is of extreme importance, which can be asked as a short note question. First, let us discuss about the blood vessel changes. Remember in blood vessel changes, there will be acute necrotizing vasculitis. All the small arteries, mainly that is the capillaries, small arteries and arteries will be affected and remember 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 in blood vessels in blood vessel I am writing BV in blood vessel there will be fibrinoid necrosis you already know what is fibrinoid necrosis from chapter 1 yes fibrinoid necrosis okay suppose in chronic stages suppose in chronic stages suppose in chronic stages what will happen there will be fibrous thickening there will be fibrous thickening there will be fibrous thickening along with the lumen narrowing along with the lumen narrowing fine yes then coming into kidney kidney remember remember around 50 percent of the sle patients have severe renal involvement in the form of two morphological patterns are there one is glomerulonephritis another one is called tubulo interstitial nephritis glomerulonephritis in simple terms i am explaining glomerulonephritis means the bowman's capsule that is the glomerulus is affected tubulo interstitial means the renal parenchyma is affected in detail we will study in renal pathology fine yes okay why this happens why this happens? Whenever there is deposition of the immunoglobulin in the glomerular basement membrane or in the renal mesangium or throughout the glomerulus, because of all the immune complex deposition, the pathogenesis happens. Fine? Yes. As per the recent classification, we have the following different. That is, we have six classes of lupus nephritis. We have six classes of lupus nephritis. Fine? Yes. Number one is called as minimal mesangial lupus nephritis, that is class one. Class one, you should remember this, no way, you have to remember, you have to buy heart, you have to remember all the key features, light microscopy, electron microscopic features of the each of these classes because this is a separate short note question for you. Minimal mesangial lupus nephritis, minimal, okay, we have something called as minimal change disease, we will see in renal pathology. Minimal means in light microscopy, there won't be any structural changes, but on immunofluorescence or in electron microscopy, we can see some immune complex deposition in the mesangial very easy see minimal mesangial lupus nephritis minimal means what in light microscopy no changes whereas in electron microscopy mesangial mesangial means in electron microscopy in immunofluorescence, fluorescence we can see the immune complex which are deposited in the mesangium so that finishes minimal mesangial lupus nephritis okay that is class one second class is mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis that means here in light microscopy or in electron microscopy or in immunofluorescence we can see mesangial proliferative that means what the mesangial cells will undergo proliferation there will be mesangial immunoglobulin that is immune complex deposits will be there in the mesangium okay yes okay that is mesangial uh, proliferative uh, this and uh, without involvement that is very important without involvement of glomerular capillaries okay in the mesangial 
proliferate only the mesangium is involved the glomerulus is not involved in class 2 then coming into focal lupus nephritis focal lupus nephritis focal okay focus what is the focus here glomerulus that means around 50 percentage of the glomerulus will be involved okay sometimes even the whole glomerulus may also be involved and the affected glomerulus there will be endothelial and mesangial cell proliferation there will be leukocyte accumulation capillary necrosis and hyaline thrombus okay yes and there will be why it is called as focal because of this focal necrosis there will be a crescent formation there will be crescent formation the patient will present with mild hematuria and proteinuria you may see rbc cast in the urine that means the red blood cells will be shed in the urine which you can see by routine urine investigations okay yes and finally this will lead to what glomerular scarring how this because this is the what injury tissue injury right so it should heal so how it is going to heal it is going to heal by scarring glomerulus will undergo scarring so this is called as focal lupus nephritis focal means 50 percentage of glomerulus involved okay or sometimes the whole glomerulus may be involved there will be proliferation of endothelial and mesangial cells leukocyte accumulation capillary necrosis hyaline thrombi crescent formation patient present with mild hematuria proteinuria rbc cast finally glomerulus healed by scar then class 4 Remember, class 4 is the most common. This is an MCQ, straight away MCQ question. Okay, class 4, okay, diffuse lupus nephritis. That is the most common and the severe form of lupus nephritis. It is what similar uh, to that of the class 3 only but the only difference is i told you that class 3 mainly less than 50 percentage of the glomerulus will be involved in class 4 the whole of the glomerulus will be involved for sure okay yes there is no or it is the complete glomerulus will be involved okay that is called as class 4 and remember this class 4 is further sub uh, what classified is subclassified into class 4 uh, g and class 4 s class 4 c s means segment that means a segment of the glomerulus is involved but remember remember even though i am saying it is segmental or global class 4 means remember more than 50 percentage of the glomerulus is affected here also you can see some crescent okay and the most important characteristic feature the most important characteristic feature in class 4 is nothing else but called as wire loop structures on electron microscopy what is that wire loop structures on electron microscopy there will be glomerular scarring the patient will be having severe hematuria proteinuria hypertension renal insufficiency okay this is one of the most common and the severe form of lupus nephritis straight to the mcq question which of the following is the most common and the most severe form of lupus nephritis answer is what diffuse lupus nephritis that is class 4 okay more than 50 percentage okay it may be either segmental or global there will be crescent formation wire loop structures on light microscopy okay i will write i have written here see wire loop lesions what are these wire loop lesions they are nothing else but see in immunofluorescence you can see some sub endothelial deposits you can see some sub endothelial deposit it indicates that the active disease associated with a very poor prognosis remember it is seen in class 3 and 4 and 5 but it is most commonly associated with the class 4 so this is called as wire loop lesions okay i will show the picture don't worry i will show the picture i will show the picture yes Okay. See, this is the picture. This is the picture. Okay. Focus on this picture. What you can see here. Okay. I am drawing with red color. Sorry, I am drawing with uh, violet color. What you can see here. This is nothing else but called as wire loop lesions. Wire loop lesions means nothing else but it is an electron microscopy finding. Okay. Wire loop lesions is nothing else but what we call it as what okay what is wire loop lesion wire loop lesion is nothing else but it is an electron microscopy finding don't say that you can see the sub endothelial deposit everything in light microscopy no it is an electron microscopic finding in an electron microscopy what you can see is that okay what you can see is that you will see a uh, sub endothelial deposit which will resemble like a loop of a wire that is why it is called as loop uh, wire loop lesion it is associated with class 3 class 4 and class 5 but it is most commonly associated with what class 4 poor prognosis it indicates that what the uh, is having an active disease okay okay fine so once that is done okay let us see some other uh, morphological features also okay yes see the first one first one this picture a okay the picture a what you are seeing here you can see proliferation in the mesangium this is focal proliferative focal proliferative 
okay don't worry if you are not able to appreciate the picture right now because we in renal pathology right from the basics we will start okay okay what are the normal responses of the kidney towards injury so then it will be very easy so this is focal proliferative okay then and b this is diffuse proliferative you can see the problems all over okay it is diffusely arranged so that is called as diffuse proliferative here it is focus okay so if i draw it in the form of a clock so you can see this is almost at 2 o'clock position this is almost at 11 o'clock position so this is uh, what we call as focal this is diffuse and finally the c okay this c um, yes so see this is actually the what i have told you this is the electron microscope picture this is the light microscopy yes are you able to appreciate can you follow my wire see i am drawing this is wire loop lesion see these are the subendothelial deposit you can see you know a loop of a wire see yes so this is a wire loop lesions okay wire loop lesions wire loop lesions classically seen in class 4 very important diff okay classically seen in diffuse lupus nephritis so this is a diffuse lupus nephritis okay yes then what else yes so this is an immunofluorescence immunofluorescence you can see granular deposits granular immunoglobulin g deposits okay immunoglobulin g deposits granular igg deposits fine yes okay so don't worry much about it because immunofluorescence everything we will see once again in renal pathology so just remember this okay so then we have class 5 class 5 is membranous lupus why it is called as membranous membranous means there will be capillary wall thickening so which will appear like a membrane okay and here we have sub epithelial deposits sub epithelial deposit and class 6 is called advanced sclerosing lupus nephritis or uh, that means almost the whole or 90 percentage of the uh, glomerulus will be involved and that is called as end stage renal disease class 5 and class 6 as far as sla is concerned it is of very less importance okay but up to class 4 you have to be very thorough so these are nothing else but what we call as the glomerular lesions. What is it? that is glomerular nephritis? What is the other entity? Tubulo interstitial nephritis. Tubulo interstitial nephritis means the immune complexes will be deposited within the peritubular capillaries. Okay, yes, that's all. Not that much importance. Mainly the SLE in the kidney, it will mainly have what produce glomerular nephritis. Okay, then so we have so far discussed about uh, the various kidney morphology also fine yes see this is the classification of lupus nephritis this is the from harrison okay harrison 21st edition 21st edition harrison class 1 minimal mesangial lupus nephritis class 2 mesangial proliferative class 3 focal lupus okay in that we have a a c and c that is active active and chronic and chronic inactive lesion with glomerular scarring remember in focal lupus nephritis only less than or what equal to 50 percentage of the glomerulus is involved then lupus nephritis with more than 50 percentage of the globe uh, is involved in that also we have active okay active and chronic uh, diffuse i told you know it may be either what class 4 may be uh, either uh, segmental or uh, G that is global okay it may be either segmental or global don't worry about the rest of the classes that's not uh, needed then class 5 class 5 almost I don't know more than uh, sorry class 5 means class 5 means uh, sub, sub epithelial immune deposits and class 6 means more than 90 percentage class 6 means more than 90 percent this is a straight away table from Harrison okay you can have a summarized view okay yes and in class 4 they have seen diffuse wire loop deposits and remember these wire loop deposits are nothing else but they are sub endothelial deposits they are sub endothelial deposits okay yes whereas here it comes into sub epithelial deposits okay they are sub epithelial deposits okay so this finishes the manifestation so if you write this much itself it's more than enough so when they ask about the lupus nephritis you have to mention about all the six classes then another most important point you have to mention here is about what are the morphological findings okay what will be seen in light microscopy electron microscopy so and so once this is over once this is done let us see about the next uh, manifestations that is skin manifestation see remember as far as sle is concerned the classical case scenario that they will give in your prof exam is a 30 year old female comes with a medicine 
COPD with a what a butterfly or malar rash over the nose and the cheeks. This is the point you have to pick up. If the word butterfly rash or malar rash is there, immediately you can close your eyes and you can very confidently write that diagnosis will be systemic lupus erythematosus. There will be apicaria, bullae and maculopapular lesions. Okay, and histologically, histologically, what will be there? There will be some vacuolar degeneration on the basal layer. Vacuolar degeneration means you can see like some vacuole, okay, vacuolated appearance on the basal layer of the epidermis and in dermis there will be inflammation of course you know due to the immunocomplex uh, immune de complex deposition there will be fibrinoid necrosis and in immunofluorescence we can see some deposition of the immunoglobulin in the dermoepidermal junction okay we will see the picture here okay we will see the picture here okay see you can see here no focus this area you can see some white areas here white areas here and these white areas are nothing else but vacuolar degeneration this is called as vacuolar degeneration okay this is an immunofluorescence see okay this is an immunofluorescence i am drawing with red color no this is the dermoepidermal junction i am writing de dermoepidermal junction this is dermis okay epidermis is not that much well marked here okay this is dermoepidermal junction dermoepidermal junction dermoepidermal junction okay this is dermoepidermal junction okay so that is the skin manifestation then joints of course the patient may present with the patient may present with the non erosive synovitis okay with a little deformity in cns there will be neuropsychiatric um, uh, manifestations then there will be pericarditis and other that is cirrhosis okay that means uh, the mesothelial surfaces will be covered okay the, the main patho okay the main pathogenesis behind all these uh, morphological features is immune complex deposition so all this will be coated with a shaggy fibrous tissue then pleural pericardial effusions all this will be present okay then coming into the cardiovascular system that is very important as, as far as cardiovascular system is concerned okay remember myocarditis okay what is that myocarditis cardiovascular system is concerned myocarditis myocarditis is most common okay and of course there will be mitral valve and aortic valve stenosis insufficiency regurgitation and the most important type of endocarditis which we en encounter in uh, sle is lipman sachs endocarditis lipman sachs endocarditis okay what is lipman sachs endocarditis as you can see in this picture that means there will be some bacterial vegetation which are act what attached to the margin of the uh, leaf uh, valvulet so this is the valve okay this is the valve and you can see the vegetation which i am drawing okay in circles these are the vegetations and remember these vegetations vegetations are characteristically attached at the margins so margins so vegetations at margins means only one diagnosis that is lipman sachs endocarditis fine we will see other type of uh, endocarditis that means in infectious endocarditis rheumatic heart disease endocarditis then non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis all these are there so in that uh, what um, what to say uh, different morphologies will be there but here in lipman sachs endocarditis remember the vegetations will be attached at the margins that to on the either side of the leaflet either side of the leaflet okay either side of the leaflet see okay this non bacterial varicose endocarditis takes the form of a single or multiple warty deposit wart like deposit distinctly on the either side of the leaflet okay fine and there remember uh, okay yeah so that is the most important thing and of course they may have uh, if they are associated with other comorbidities like atherosclerosis hypertension they may have also developed for coronary artery disease okay they may be more prone for coronary artery disease that is the cardiovascular manifestation then coming into spleen in spleen there will be splenomegaly capsular thickening follicular hyperplasia that means the follicles will be uh, hyperplasia uh, okay uh, yeah and remember remember the arteries okay what is that arteries okay that is the central penicillary arteries the central penicillary arteries of the spleen will show some concentric intimal and smooth muscle cell hyperplasia this is what we call it as onion skin uh, onion skin appearance 
onion skin appearance because it looks like the what an onion skin so these are nothing else but what what is onion skin appearance that is the central pencillary arteries you know they will have some concentric smooth muscle and intimal cell hyperplasia we call it as onion skin lesions and in lungs of course i told you know what is that shrinking uh, shrinking lung syndrome interstitial fibrosis pleural uh, effusion pleuritis secondary pulmonary hypertension all this will occur fine yes and another important thing le cell or hematoxylin bodies okay what is le bodies you know what is le cell you know you can see this le cell or the hematoxylin bodies all this you know yeah okay mm. yes okay you can see uh, all this uh, that is in bone marrow in bone marrow bone marrow bone marrow you can see le cell okay bone marrow you can see le cell Okay. Fine. So these are some of the features and lymph nodes may be enlarged due to this presence of uh, what the germinal centers which undergo hyperplasia. There will be activated cytotoxic T lymphocytes and macrophages, activated C's uh, and so this uh, what LE cells everything in the bone marrow it will mimic what we call as T cell lymphoma. Okay, all this will mimic T cell lymphoma. Fine. So I have told you the SLE is a multi-systemic disease. There will be clinical features, serological, morphological features. I told you know there will be arthritis, uh, polyarthritis, butterfly rashes, photosensitivity, pleuritic chest pain. So it is very difficult to diagnose this case. Okay, SLE it is very difficult to diagnose because the patient have almost all systemic features. Okay, all systemic features. Fine. Yes, the patient will have uh, all systemic features. Fine. So what to um, like? Uh, it is very difficult to diagnose the uh, case of systemic lupus erythematosus. Hence, American College of Rheumatology. Okay, American College of Rheumatology, as well as uh, what we call it as uh, the U, uh, has put forward a classification that is based on some clinical features and some immunological features, so that we can diagnose. okay which we can uh, diagnose uh, what to say um, the case of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus fine yes for that we have a classification okay yes one second First one is the systemic lupus international collaborating clinical criteria um, for classification of systemic lupus erythematosus. So this is the classification that actually we are following. Okay. So I think as far as an undergraduate is concerned, we should just remember this classification that is the clinical and immunological manifestation, but the one which is given in Robbins. Okay. The one which is given in Robbins, Robbins is a 1997 classification. 1997 classification which is an outdated one okay which is outdated one these are the updated one these are the updated one in 1990 and uh, 1997 what to say classification it is very uh, what uh, they took into account almost all the features but that's not the case with the updated one the updated one has not been mentioned in robins so this is the uh, table from the uh, what harrison so you can refer this Okay, one second.
Okay, now let us see what are the clinical manifestations. Clinical manifestations, what is the current classification takes into account? Skin. Skin which may be either acute, subacute or cutaneous lupus erythematosus that is photosensitive malar rashes. Then or chronic cutaneous in case of what? Discoid lupus. We will see what is discoid lupus, drug induced lupus and all very soon. Then oral nasal ulcers, non-scaring alopecia, synovitis including more than or equal to two joint, Pleurisy pericarditis. In renal, okay, protein creatine ratio should be more than or equal to 0.5. RBC cast. Then neurological seizures, psychosis, mononeuritis, myelitis. Then hemolytic anemia, leukopenia less than 4000 per microliter, thrombocytopenia less than 1 lakh per microliter. So these are the clinical classification. Immunological manifestation, ANA should be more than the reference value, anti double standard DNA more than reference value, anti SM, anti phospholipid. Okay. Then low serum complement. This is very important. I have already told you because since the complements are used for the formation of immune complexes, what will happen? The serum uh, complement levels will be falling and the positive direct Combs test. Positive direct Combs test which again suggests hemolytic anemia. Fine. So this is the clinical manifestations and immunological manifestation. I request you to follow only this table. Okay. The what which is mentioned in Robbins is uh, updated. Uh, it's an outdated one. So it is a 1997 classification. This is the latest 2000. 2019. Based on this what features, the American College of Rheumatology has given the 2019 what classification criteria. So actually, it is not needed for us to remember um, what to say. Um, this scoring and all those things but again you have to just remember see the same features only okay the same features which are mentioned in this table they have given some scoring and finally they tell that finally you just remember the reference okay positive okay when you say that a patient is having a systemic lupus erythematosus yes systemic lupus erythematosus positive anti-nuclear antibody okay Titer at least 1 is to 80 is obligatory entry criterion followed by some additional 7 clinical and 3 immunological domains. And altogether, if the score is more than 10, or we call it as SLE. So that means positive anti nuclear antibody plus 7 clinical criteria plus 3 immunological criteria three immunological criteria okay three immunological criteria with a score more than or equal to 10 points will diagnose systemic lupus erythematosus just remember this so out of that let us see what are the various domain yes See, constitutional 80 percentage, 50 percentage hematological, 75 percentage neuropsychiatric, again mucocutaneous 80 percentage, serocell, musculoskeletal, renal, all those, and finally antiphospholipid complement and SLE specific antibody. There is no need for you to remember this scoring system, but just remember. I have uh, what inserted this pic to um, what make you aware that based on a scoring system okay suppose if fever is present we will give okay two score okay if the leukopenia is present we will put three score so based so you may not make you aware that there is a scoring system existing I have put this table just to remember this final this final what inference okay nothing else just to remember this final uh, what to say inference nothing else so more than equal to 10 points we will diagnose this having systemic lupus erythematosus but this table is very important clinical manifest Manifestations and the immunological manifestation you have to remember it is 2019 updates okay yes so once this is done so so far we have diagnosed the patient is having systemic lupus erythematosus what are the drugs what are the drugs I am just going to say the name of the drugs that is more than enough for you so number one is NSAIDs salicylate topical glucocorticoids sunscreens hydroxychloroquine Okay, methotrexate, glucocorticoids oral, methyl prednisolone, cyclophosphamide IV or oral, mycophenolate mofetil, mycophenolate mofetil, all these are immunomodulators, then azathioprine, rituximab, 
tacrolimus so these are the name of the drugs at last at last just a word just put a heading treatment for sle and you can mention this or what four to five drugs any four to five drugs and most commonly used most commonly used are some nsids okay topical glucocorticoids okay uh, okay we very rarely only we will use this uh, immunomodulators okay yeah, since it is an autoimmune disorder only the immunomodulators will work but remember immunomodulators cannot be uh, simply uh, what prescribed fine yes okay so once that is done at last at last we are coming to the end of this at last that is nothing else but drug induced lupus drug induced lupus erythematosus i told you ship drugs sulfonamides hydralazine isoniazid penicillamine okay uh, or procainamide yes all these ship drugs they are associated to or they will produce some lupus erythematosus like features they will produce lupus erythematosus like features so what are the name of the drugs hydralazine procainamide isoniazid and d penicillamine okay fine remember hydralazine okay hydralazine okay hydralazine that is hla dr4 that means if the patient is having hla dr polymorphism that patient is taking hydralazine he will develop or he or she will develop sle similarly procainamide if the patient is taking so if the patient is having hla dr6 polymorphism and the patient is taking procainamide okay what will happen the procainamide uh, what to say yeah the patient will develop uh <laughs> yes the patient will develop uh, systemic lupus erythematosus diagnosis i have already told you from the harrison table anti histone antibodies are the diagnostic antibodies okay they are the classical most specific most sensitive antibodies for drug induced lupus okay and remember compared to the classical systemic lupus erythematosus the cns and the renal involvements are very rare in case of drug induced lupus erythematosus okay yes and what is chronic discoid lupus erythematosus in which the skin manifestations will be more but the systemic manifestations will be very low uh, that means rare that means there will be skin plague follicular plugging skin atrophy elevated erythematous border okay yes very few patients only will develop systemic manifestation what do you mean by subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus that means it is a condition which is intermediate between the classical systemic lupus erythematosus as well as between chronic discoid lupus erythematosus here there will be what moderately that means some 50 percentage uh, skin manifestations with 50 percent is systemic manifestations okay yes all these are very mild classifications and remember i remember this uh, this is most commonly associated with hla dr3 phenotype yeah that is a single point you have to remember subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus is most commonly associated with hla dr3 hla dr3 okay i hope that is clear for you hla dr3 genotype so so far so far we have discussed in detail so far we have discussed in detail about the today morphology clinical criteria scoring acr ular classification 2019 remember more than 10 points positive ana seven clinical and three immunological then drug induced lupus chronic discoid lupus subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus then various classification of the lupus nephritis okay see that is actually the international society of nephrology and renal pathology uh, classification okay we have discussed that then remember this table again the uh, clinical and immunological manifestations and what are the drugs so finally in two parts we have discussed in two parts we have discussed okay we have discussed in two parts we have discussed in two parts we have discussed the systemic lupus erythematosus in detail in depth we have discussed okay i hope it is very clear for you so hope you have enjoyed this session fine please watch this go through this table revise it again and again lupus nephrite is very important sle is a very important and it is one of the what most commonly asked sa question in your first paper okay in paper 1 in your general pathology okay yes so please go and read this uh, tables okay criteria and please don't follow the 1997 outdated classification in robins please go for this updated classification clear for clinical criteria thank you